generations to come. Good afternoon. It is 12.08 p.m. on Wednesday, April 19th in the East Coast of the United States. And welcome to another edition of the TDN Writers Room Podcast. My name is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the TDN. I also co-host the Down the Stretch radio show every Saturday on Sirius XM Radio. And want to remind you that we are presented by Keeneland. There you go. Hi, y'all. I'm Randy Moss, NBC Sports. Uh, Already... Eyebrow deep in preparation, not only for the Kentucky Derby and the Kentucky Oaks, but all of those undercard races Friday and Saturday that NBC will be televising. Zoe Kaplan here with First Racing and XBTV. If you're wondering where I am, I am not on a desert island somewhere with a pina colada in my hand, although sometimes I wish I was. I'm at the OBS April Breeze Show. They're just going through the third set right now, so I'll be down here for probably at least the next week, uh, trying to find some diamonds in the rough. And there are plenty, for sure. All right. Maybe we'll check in with you next week, get a wrap-up of the Ocala sale, the April version of it, Zoe. Um, Let's get right to the subject matter at hand. The Lexington at Keeneland wasn't the most important race of the weekend so far as purse, graded status, et cetera. But, you know, we've been talking for weeks upon end about the Kentucky Derby and the three-year-old picture. So let's start with this. A um, couple storylines here. First, the race was won by First Mission, trained by Brad Cox by a half-length over Arabian Lion. Um, he is not going in the Kentucky Derby. He doesn't have enough points. You only get a handful of them in the Lexington, but um, it likely will go in the Preakness. Uh, an up-and-coming horse for Brad Cox, who just broken his maiden at the fairgrounds, goes then and wins the uh, Lexington over Arabian Lion. Disarm was third. He picked up enough points to get in to the Kentucky Derby field for Steve Asmus, and he'll be one of those 40 to one shots or, or whatever. But, you know, after Rip Strike won last year, not going to count on anybody uh, in the crazy world of the Kentucky Derby. And another storyline was the ride by Arad Ortiz. And if you look at the head on, it's Arad doing what Arad does. He's on Arabian Lion. He's in about the five path. Here comes Luis Saez with first mission up the rail. And what does uh, uh, Irad do? He comes over abruptly, doesn't make the other horse steady or, or, or anything like that. But, you know, it was definitely, I shouldn't say definitely, but it appears to be a case of aggressive race riding. Aggressive race riding, good race riding, dirty tactics. I don't know. Maybe Zoe Cadman will have an opinion on that as our former jockey on the panel. But uh, Randy, lots to discuss in the Lexington. What are some of your thoughts? Overly aggressive and unnecessarily aggressive on the part of Ired Ortiz. And we sound like a broken record talking about this. It happens over and over and over again. And it's going to keep happening unless the stewards do something about it. In this case, you can't really say that it was a flagrant violation of racing rules. He did brush up against uh, Arabian Lion briefly, maybe at about the eighth pole or so. He also came over on him a bit going into the first turn. You can give him an excuse for that because Arabian Lion was trying to drop into the rail, set the pace. A lot of riders do that. But, I mean, this thing's just happening over and over and over again with Irad Ortiz. Uh, the race was impactful. You mentioned first mission, probably a Preakness candidate. Uh, I've lost count now how many of these three-year-old prep races Brad Cox has won. Uh, Arabian Lion rebounded for Bob Baffert from a disappointing effort to uh, a nice front-running second, almost pulled it off. Uh, whether he can get a mile and three-sixteenths in the Preakness or not, I don't know. Disarm may be a bit disappointing. He lost ground from the quarter pole to the finish on the top two finishers, but he was dialing back in distance from a mile and three sixteenths of the Louisiana Derby to a mile and one sixteenth of the Lexington. They probably had to work on him a little more to keep him close at a mile and a sixteenth. Might have impacted his closing punch. Uh, their best hope for the Kentucky Derby is that he really loves a mile and a quarter. It's getting windy now. If you can hear the wind, I, I feel like I'm about to get in a hurricane right now sitting outside. But as far as a rat. Um, yes, it was aggressive, but he didn't cross the line. And basically it was intimidation. Yeah, he saw the horse come through the inside. It was a fantastic ride by Saez, who had this horse under a ride for an awful, awful long way. And he snuck up the rail because there was plenty of room. Arad saw him there, came down, didn't cross the line, 
intimidation. That horse didn't care. It's like, I'm coming through and I'm going to beat you regardless. So he didn't cross the line there. I'm, I'm fine with it because, I mean, that's what Arad does. I think the best horse won, Arabian Lion. Does he have distance limitations? I, I'm not sure. I think he got beat on the square, fair and square. And the Lexington, as for Disarm, you mentioned it last week, Randy. You know, he's going to knock some hopefuls out that are hoping to get to the Derby. And that's exactly what he did. Whether he's a factor, who knows? He's got Gunrunner on his side. That is for darn sure. So uh, we'll, we'll have to see how Disarm does. Yeah, you know, Asmussen, this is the one race that has eluded him. He thought he won it last year. He still, I believe, is still pinching himself that he got beat last year because at the eighth pole, he looked like he had it won with Epicenter. So we'll, we'll have to see what goes forward. So, Bill, you mentioned Rich Stride. You know, th that upset win has had impact in more ways than one. One way, of course, is that trainers with long shots are more encouraged to give it a chance now, whereas maybe pre-Rich Stride he might have been less inclined. But also, Steve Asmussen was pointing out after after the defeat of, Ep of Epicenter last year by Rich Strike that it now encourages trainers that have multiple horses to run as many as they can. Because if Asmussen, in hindsight, could have run another horse and excluded, first, uh, or ex excluded Rich Strike from being in the race to begin with, then that's one fewer competitor that you have to worry about. So that's also sort of a uh, an offshoot to uh, to the big upset last year. You know, my, personally, my take on it w was for years, you know, why do people want to be 100 to 1 in the Kentucky Derby? Why are you throwing these horses in here that seemingly have no chance? But it's not just Rich Strike. Mind that bird was also just impossible to come up with as a handicapper. You never would give them any chance whatsoever. So I, I guess the, the theory that everyone is doing now is just get into the race and see what happens. Um, I, I guess you can't argue too much about that. Uh, Randy, um, you were, did a great job during this the Breeders' the Cup. Derby. It's, it's the Derby. Anyone that knows anything about horse racing has always heard of the Kentucky Derby. So if you're an owner, of course you want to go. You want to tell your friends you've got a horse in the Derby? It's like going to the Super Bowl. Like, that is the one reason. This is the driving force why people put their 100 to 1 shots, because it's the Derby. Any trainer in the world will tell you if they're in America, oh, have you won the Kentucky Derby? That's the only race anybody cares about that does not know horse racing. Okay, Randy, uh, during the Breeders' Cup, we asked you to make up some morning lines for us. Uh, I asked you, to, now, you, we have the 20 top horses right now. It could change, but... Um, let, uh, Randy uh, gave us a morning line. Forte, 7 to 2. Tappet Trice, 5 to 1. Angel of Empire, 6 to 1. Derma Sotagati, 6 to 1. Practical Move, 7 to 1. And, and on down the list. Um, Randy, I checked your line versus some of the lines coming out in Las Vegas. And uh, some of them have Forte as low as 2 to 1. Um, I, I think you're on the right side of this. 7 to 2 is more likely it, uh, than 2 to 1, maybe 3 to 1, something like that. But, uh, and the other one that um, you were. Uh, Kind of in disagreement with some of the other lines I've seen was Angel of Empire at six to one. Um, I've seen him as high as 14 to one in some of the race books in Las Vegas, which I don't understand that at all. Um, why, why anybody would think he'd be, he's not going to be 14 to one. I don't know if he's going to be six, but I think he'll be closer to six than he was 14. So, you know, Randy, some of your thoughts on, on the morning line. Yeah, I also saw an online race book that had Hoosier Philly 20 to one in the Kentucky <laughs> Dirt. So, you know, sometimes you got to take those with a grain of salt that aren't really updated. Um, no, I, I was going to I I was going to make uh, Forte the favorite. I think there's a strong possibility that he'll be the favorite probability. But it was to me it was either do you make him three to one or do you make him seven to two. I don't think he's going to go as high as four to one, and I don't think he's going to go as low as five to two or two to one. So I think that's the sweet spot somewhere in there. Uh, after that, uh, I could see either one of the next uh, three or four horses uh, becoming second choice in the betting. That's why I kind of grouped them all pretty close together. But again, the line was, um, it's an early line before the post position draw, which could have some impact. And also, as you pointed out, uh, there may be some defections and some additions to the Kentucky Derby field over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so we'll see about that. But it's a fun exercise. I like doing that every year. And I do it anyway. Zoe, you think he's right? Forte at 7-2? to two? Uh, I 
can you book my bet right now? I'll I'll take your line. I'll take seven or two. Yeah, absolutely. And then I'll I'll double it up with the actual derby pool with Angel of Empire. So uh, that'll be my exacta. All right. Some other odds uh, that Randy had: uh, Kings Barnes at fifteen to one, two fills at twenty to one. On down the list, all the way to Wild on Ice uh, down there at eighty to one. So he's this year's Rich Strike. What's Dermasodagaki? Uh, he has Dermasodagaki at six to one, showing a lot of confidence in uh, in the Japanese invader. Did you see his work this morning at Churchill? That was just a Did little not, snippet. No. He actually looked really good getting over the Churchill down strip. 49 and change, his first leg stretcher out there. Randy, you should have been on that already. Uh, no, I should have been. I'll have to look it up as soon as we get off the air here. Yes. <laughs> Derma. All right, so let's stay on the subject of major races from last week. And on Friday was the Maker's Mark Mile out at Keeneland. And uh, a major upset in there, Shea Pierre beat Modern Games. Uh, the final margin was three and a half lengths. It might have well been 30. I mean, Modern Games was never in the hunt, never going to win that race. I'm a little bit surprised that he he ran second. Um, I guess maybe the assumption, I think Modern Games perhaps ran his race. And we got this freaky good performance from Shea Pierre. Another thing worth noting, we're going to, uh, Dan Ross and the Thoroughbred Daily News this week had an insightful story about more, you know, something we've been talking a lot about, the CAW, the computer players. And uh, Shea Pierre, when they loaded into the gate, was 24 to 1. When they left the gate, he was 11 to 1, crossed the wire at 9 to 1. So, a, again, a the type of major odd shifts we see that uh, a lot of the normal betters, uh, people who aren't betting millions, uh, are uh, obviously not happy about that. But, um, gang, what did you think of the Maker's Mark Mile? Um, I was beginning to think Charlie Appleby would never lose a race. He also lost on Saturday at Keeneland when he ran second behind in Italian in the Jenny Wiley. So, hey, Charlie Appleby's human after all. Yeah, he most certainly is. And I'll start off talking about modern games who look like a different horse in the post parade. He looks like he's filled out and is ready for the breeding shed. I'm not going to say he was fat because Charlie doesn't usually run a short horse, but this is a different modern games than we saw last year. And it was only a few months ago he came out in a hood. They wear, they put the red hood on that they go down into the start, which he's never worn in the pre parade before. So that was different. He got a little hot. He got a little warm. I'm just wondering if, if maybe the breeding shed is already calling him, I'm not quite sure, but that wasn't the horse that we saw that was so brilliant last year. He ran a good race. Honestly, I had my eyes on the winner, Shea Pierre, and I couldn't even believe that he got up for second. Buick was, had him under a ride at the three and a half pole there on the turf course. I'm like, there's no way he's done. I, credit to the horse to run second, to be perfectly honest, because he made up a, a ton of ground. Maybe he did need the race. Looking at him physically, I'm going to go with that, that he needed the race. Or perhaps looking at Shea Pierre, he's a five-year-old gelding. He's a superstar. He got an ideal trip under Pratt. Dr. Zempf, who I liked, headed him down the backside, took off. I think that actually helped him. He let the horse go. He relaxed. He got a nice half mile. That opening quarter was good, 23 and change for Pratt, and he drew off like a good thing. Chez Pierre is the real deal of that race at Keeneland, and we'll have to see what uh, Modern Games does in his next start. Yeah, I think there are two truths in here that are not necessarily conflicting. Number one, Modern Games appeared to be a little short in his first race since the Breeders' Cup mile victory at Keeneland. Uh, and then secondly, that Chez Pierre is indeed for real. I uh, mean, Modern Games win his last quarter in 22 and 1, which was the fastest quarter mile in the race. But uh, there was no way he was going to be catching up to Chez Pierre, who ran his last quarter in 22 and 3. Like, Chez Pierre is a really good horse. I mean, he won uh, the first, what, the first four or five starts of his career. I think he was five for five. Uh, but the first three in France for owner Roy Jackson, Roy and Gretchen Jackson, of course, Ly Lyle Stable, the former owners of Barbaro, have a presence in Europe as well as the United States. So he began a career in France. Then he came over to the United States, had a couple of wins here, including a really impressive eye-catching win in the Henry Clark at Laurel. Uh, then he was injured, as trainer uh, Arno Bell Bellicor pointed out. It was a setback. It said it took us a while to bring him back. He came back at Tampa loomed boldly at the top of the stretch in the stakes at Tampa, looked like he was going to win, but came up short. 
obviously needed that race. And boy, was he impressive with a stakes record mile in 133.46. He is a horse that um, is going to be reckoned with this year in the mile division if he can stay sound. He's had a lot of gaps in his race record. He's a five-year-old with only seven lifetime starts. He's had a 10-month gap when he came to the United States. He had a nine-and-a-half-month gap before his comeback race at Tampa. So he's obviously got some problems, but when he is right, boy, like he was Saturday, he is good. Yeah, Randy, I would agree with that. I mean, Shapiro was just the better horse, and he just thrashed Modern Games. Um, and, uh, you know, if Modern Games was not 100%, I'm sure he was 95 or 90 so a very impressive performance there. Saturday at Oakland Park, the Apple Blossom. And as a handicapper going into the Azari, I thought Claire Ayer was a cinch. I didn't think Secret Oath had a prayer to beat her. Secret Oath not only beats her, he beats her ha handily. So, okay, now I'm off the Claire Ayer bandwagon. I'm on the Secret Oath bandwagon. It's not just me. I, I mean, they made Secret Oath the heavy favorite in there. And a totally different, you, know, you just flip the performances upside down from what you saw from the Azari. I mean, Secret Oath ran great. You know, we all like to see Wayne Lucas perform in these big spots. And, uh, you know, could he get another grade one, another win in a huge race th this year? Well, uh, Clarier, who, by the way, uh, at the top of the stretch, as Secret Oath pulled away, you wouldn't have given any chance for her to catch this filly. I, I mean, Secret Oath was home free. And Clarier, she just put her head down and motored through the stretch. An absolutely very impressive performance from her. I don't know why she was so much better in this race than she was in the Azaria, or maybe Secret Oath wasn't quite as good, or maybe a little bit of both. But uh, Clarier, uh, we're still waiting on Ness to come back. Um, I see that she had her first workout of 2023 uh, just the other day. But for now, Clarier assumes the leadership of, of what is a, a, a good division right now, some good fillies in there. Yeah, I think the logical analysis of this looking back is that uh, Clarier needed the race in the Azari more than Secret Oath did coming off the layoff. Neither had run since the Breeders' Cup distaff. They both took steps forward in the Apple Blossom. Clarier just took a bigger step forward. She also had a little more pace to run at in the Apple Blossom, thanks to Hot and Sultry getting out there and opening up four and a half. Um and by the way, what a great spot for Hot and Sultry to be grade one stakes place now, finishing third in a four-horse field. But both horses ran really well, Clarier and Secret Oath. Uh, Clarier expected to run next in the Ogden Phipps. Last year, Clarier was second to Latruska in the Apple Blossom and then came back in her next start to win the Ogden Phipps. And while we're talking about Clarier, let me just finish with this. Three cheers to Barbara Banke of Stone Street Stable for keeping Clarier in training at age five. It would have been so easy to retire a horse with her credentials, $2 million in earnings by Curlin out of a three-time grade one stakes winner in cavorting. Uh, but yet, uh, Barbara chose to keep this horse racing as a five-year-old and horse players everywhere should be applauding that decision. I applaud it. I, I echo those sentiments exactly. Kudos to Stone Street and Barbara Banke because she could well be in the breeding shed right now. It was a terrific race for me. I think the short field and the less traffic, she was a little bit closer than she was in her last race. Honestly, I didn't think they were going to pass Secret Oath, even at the quarter pole. I thought Secret Oath was home free. I'm like, wouldn't that be cool? And here he comes. Honestly, Joel Rosario looked like Luis Saez riding a bicycle from the half mile pole. He rode her and won the race on her. It really was a terrific horse race for a short field. And honestly, Secret Oath lost nothing in defeat. This is going to be a terrific match out, match up throughout the year. And this is what horse racing needs. They need, you know, in the days where these three year old colts go off to the breeding shed, these mares are keeping us around and they're keeping us entertained. Five years old. And she's keeping going. So long may it last. Kudos to all of them. And the connections of Secret Oath as well to keep her going. It's going to be a fantastic to watch them this year. Yeah, I remember Secret Oath was in the fall sales and they pulled her out of there uh, so that she could race another year. Now, the new owner might have, if, if she had sold, the new owner might have uh, kept her racing. Not, but um, Rob and Stacey Mitchell, the uh, owners and breeders, I uh, had her in the sale. They pulled her out because, uh, as Wayne Lucas said, they, they wanted more action this year. So you're right, Zoe, you know, the, we're not going to see too many superstar males come back at four and five. So uh, good for the Phillies for at least giving us a little bit more uh, action and letting us go uh, beyond the three-year-old year. So applaud, uh, 
kudos to, to everybody involved. One for the girls. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by Keeneland. Last September, we witnessed an unprecedented energy, magic, and momentum of the highest grossing auction in Keeneland history. And this year, it all returns at the Keeneland September Yearling Sale. Entry deadline is May the 1st. Learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. If this place could talk, it would roar. It would say, this is racing. This beating heart in the heart of horse country. Steady and strong beneath the roar. Reminding us why. For the love of the horse. For generations to come. Spites Town. Bunning. Echo Town. It's Echo Town for Joe Talamo and Echo Town. Race the way. And Echo Town is drawing away in the stretch. Echo Town wins the Allen Jerkin Stakes. A sire line so prolific it repeats itself. Echo Town. The TDM Writers Room is brought to you by Coolmore. Key of Life became Motown's latest graded stakes winner when she won her second straight stakes on Sunday with a win in the Grade 2 Beaumont Stakes at Keeneland. That's two first crop stakes winners for Motown at the Keeneland meet. Meanwhile, Practical Joke had stakes winners on two continents over the weekend. His four-year-old Skelly won the Grade 3 Count Fleet Stakes at Aqueduct to become his newest graded stakes winner, while the two-year-old Richie became her sire's newest juvenile stakes winner on Saturday with the seventh length victory in the Classico Alberto Via L'Atelier in Chile. So some of the news of the week involved Turf Paradise and uh, a track that has been in the headlines for a lot of the wrong reasons lately. Uh, The owner of Turf Paradise has reached an agreement with a company which is going to uh, presumably develop the property. Uh, They say it won't happen overnight. There's a horseman's group in Arizona thought they might get at least two years more out of racing at Turf Paradise, uh, maybe three years. There's also reports out there that Zoe's uh, employers, the first racing in the Stronach group, might come in and buy Arizona Downs and open that up. But, you know, a couple things about this. Um, Normally, um, I'm not necessarily against some of these racetracks closing because there's too much racing in the United States. We need less racing, but that's more a uh, East Coast thing. In the West Coast, you really only have California and then Turf Paradise. You don't have that glut of racing like we have, especially in the Mid-Atlantic uh, region where there might be you know, six tracks within 200 miles of each other running every Saturday. And you know, Turf Paradise serves a purpose. Um, it's If you can't make it on the West Coast with uh, the Southern California horses, they need a place to go. Um, Turf Paradise is sort of an outlet for those horses. Um, and let's hope that there's a, a better ending to the story. Maybe Arizona Downs will come in and be a big success and take over uh, where Turf Paradise fit in on the schedule. But um, you know, I normally I have mixed feelings about this. I'm interested to see what Randy and Zoe think. But um, by and large, I don't think it's a good thing for horse racing to lose this race. No, I mean, the biggest issue that we see in it with this is sort of like the Hollywood Park syndrome, where the land that the racetrack is on exactly. becomes more valuable than the owners can make using it as, as a racetrack, right? Um, I mean, look at the look at SoFi Stadium right now where Hollywood Park used to be. Uh, so that's probably what's going on in Phoenix with Turf Paradise. Uh, the owner, current owner, Says he wants to spend more time with his uh, with his grandkids. Hopefully, the new owner, whoever it will be, uh, chooses to keep it operating as a racetrack. But it does seem like it's a bit of a long shot. If they do choose to keep operating it as a racetrack, I hope they take care of it a little better than it's being taken care of right now. Um, I was in Arizona uh, for NBC uh, for the 2015 Super Bowl in Glendale. Uh, the one where Malcolm Butler had that great interception for the New England Patriots and they beat the Seattle Seahawks. But Friday before the Super Bowl, I decided to go to Turf Paradise. Never been before. It was a rainy Friday afternoon. Wanted to add it to my list 
of racetracks that I had visited. I'd heard great things from friends of mine who said that uh, they grew up around Turfway, or excuse me, Turf Paradise. Uh, thought it was a gem, thought it was beautiful. I ran into Al Michaels in the hotel lobby. He asked me where I was going. I told him Turf Paradise. Oh, my God. You know, I went to college at the University of Arizona. I, I, I almost grew up in college going to Turf Paradise all the time. He said, give me a progress report when you get back. Tell me about Turf Paradise and how it's doing. And I walked into Turf Paradise, and it was, to put it mildly, not in good shape. Um, I, I feel for racetracks, small racetracks that struggle financially to make ends meet. This was a situation, though, where the racetrack was just simply not cared for. So, you know, there's only a couple hundred people there in the grandstand that day anyway. So I hope that whoever takes over Turf Paradise, if they choose to keep it running as a racetrack, uh, pays a little bit more attention to the details of a racetrack, to the paint, to things like that. It's just the general upkeep, because I think the racetrack uh, deserves that. Randy, it's interesting you, you brought that up. And I, I've been to Turf Paris. I, I don't think I've been there since 2015. But your scenario, that is eight years ago. And I doubt they put much money yeah. into the place. I imagine it's probably even all that much worse now. I mean, when I walked in and there was a Turf Paradise sign and half the letters were crooked and, and a couple were missing. And then there are, you know, uh, ceiling panels missing all over the place. Uh, I, my gosh, what is going on here? So I walked around for about 30 minutes and left. I didn't want to stay any, any, any longer. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very disappointing. And the racetrack is really pretty outside. You can see the infield and all that, you know. Uh, it deserves better. And if it keeps going as a racetrack, which I hope it does, I hope it gets better. Yeah, I, I missed the first part of your conversation. I got cut off for a minute. But um, as far as Turf Paradise, you know, Southern California, Arizona, they need some kind of circuit. So especially Northern California as well, a lot of horses flip and flop between that. We do need a circuit. So you would love to think that Turf Paradise does keep going. I'm not sure what's going to go on with Arizona Downs. You know, there's lots of mumblings about first racing, buying it. But they've looked at both properties. That's all anybody is saying, according to Dan Ross's article. I will say one thing. As far as racing in the summer months, if you're going to race anywhere, you'd much rather be at Arizona Downs. I looked up the temperatures for this weekend in, in uh, Turf Paradise. It's going to be at least 95 degrees on Saturday. But if you take a look at the temperature at Arizona Downs, wow. it's going to be about 78 degrees. So if you're looking for somewhere to have some other summertime racing, I mean, the, the weather's going to be great. That, uh, that's a big plus. So we'll have to wait and see what happens. I, I you know, and, and uh, the people from the Stronic Group uh, haven't said much. Honestly, you know, I'm not rooting against Arizona Downs, but... I don't for the life of me understand why they would want to buy it. Uh, I mean, a small little racetrack with little handle has no slot machines, no casinos whatsoever. I mean, there are smarter people than I am, but I kind of don't get it. Like I said, I'm not rooting against them coming in and saving Arizona racing. But, uh, you know, the days where a little track like that without alternative revenue streams can make it are, are you know, long gone. So uh, hopefully they, uh, you know, they have a couple of uh, tricks up their sleeve. Um so speaking of the TDN, Dan Ross uh, also did uh, another story. We, I talked earlier about the odds drops on Chez Pierre uh, in, in the, uh, the race at Keeneland um, in the Maker's Mark. And uh, Dan had uh, looked at the CAW, the computer uh, wagering aspects in California. And, you know, he and the people he talked to kind of came to the same uh, conclusions that I have and a lot of people have kind of, you know, what do you do here? They are these people are betting he at the um, at this recently concluded Santa Anita meet um, one entity elite turf club uh, accounted for twenty two point eight nine percent of the um, handle. I'm surprised it wasn't higher than that. He, another statistic where uh, the, the CAW wagering at Del Mar uh, since 2018 is up fifty six point one percent. So if you ban these guys, you lose millions and millions and millions in handle to racing can't afford. If you keep these guys around and they keep growing as they are, they become a bigger part of the handle. You know, that that creates a, you know, a monster load of problems 
or what is happening to the everyday regular players and how, to me, these guys are just cleaning everybody else out. But um, Dan had some interesting uh, uh, nuggets in there that, that I didn't know before. And one thing that racetracks are trying to do is kind of less even the playing field a little bit. And there's two things that they're doing out at Santa Anita um, that I thought were, were interesting. In the Rainbow Six, they've effectively banned them from being able to take down the whole pool on a non-jackpot day because they're making a bet in 40 cent intervals. It's a 20 cent bet. So if they hit it, they're going to hit it twice and there's not going to be one winner. The other thing they've done, they said, is they put a 3.5% surcharge um, on, on, on their win bets. So, um, you know, that's going to discourage them from going in the wind pool and where we see these huge odds drops. I mean, I'm fascinated by the subject. I wish I had the answers to it because it's a very difficult thing. And um, like I said before, you, you know, there's no easy answer to this. But um, I like the fact that at least in California, they're trying to, you know, kind of get a, a better grip on the situation and, you know, make it where the common guy at least doesn't feel like they're getting murdered at the windows, you know, where the horse goes into the gate at six to one, crosses the wire at five to two. It's a real quandary. I mean, the thoroughbred industry has sort of painted itself into a corner of the racing industry. And, and, and now, as you pointed out, it's, uh, they're in a, an extremely difficult situation. They can't really do without the revenue because if you take out the CAW revenue, it shows that the rank and file gambling on horse racing has dropped precipitously over the last decade or so. Uh, so they need that money, but they need to figure out a way to get that money without either alienating or choking off, uh, draining the bankrolls of their of their regular customers. I, yeah, I've got no problem necessarily with the rebates. I mean, every business. I mean, look, look at the airline industry. Uh, with all the frequent flyer miles, uh, that's essentially essentially rebating their best customers. Businesses all over the place do that. Starbucks does it. Everybody does it nowadays. The problem that I have, though, is that it's, you know, paramutual betting is me against you guys. It's, it's competition. That's the definition of paramutual betting. One better against another. And what they've done is they've given the CAWs access to the pools that no one else is granted. The computer programs, which are, which are fine. I mean, if you come up with a computer program, you build a better mousetrap, uh, fantastic. Good for you, right? Free enterprise. But to allow some people direct access into the pools to let their computers scan all of the pools and make last second bets and not offer that to everyone, to me, is giving the CAW players an unfair advantage. As far as the late odds drops, yeah. You know, Naira has tried to address that, uh, but that's basically just window dressing. I mean, I applaud Naira for doing it. It makes the betters feel better not to see odds drops like we saw in the Lexington when horses go into the gate and then wind up going off, you know, way, way lower when the race is run. But that stuff's still going on in exacta pools, trifecta pools, superfecta pools, pick three, pick four, pick five. Even more so, probably, because they're betting more into those pools than they do into the wind pools. Horse players just don't see it. So really, it's just kind of window dressing to make people feel better that they don't see the late odds drops. The problem is a lot deeper than that, and I wish I had the answers, but something's got to be done. Um, I think you're between a rock, a rock and a hard place. Honestly, you need the money coming in. You need the revenue. Uh, I don't know what the right answer to it is. It'll take someone a lot brighter than me to try and figure that out. You know, in a in a perfect world, Bill, you could sit every stakeholder in thoroughbred racing down, put them in a big room, and have them hammer out a unanimous agreement that helps the situation. Does that sound like horse racing to you? Oh yeah, absolutely. Definitely sounds like horse racing. And um, so we know that's not going to happen. Um, another point about this is they're playing. You know, like Dan has the statistic that they've increased their betting by fifty six percent at Del Mar. When do we get to a situation where these guys are just betting? They, they take up so much among the pools that they're just betting against themselves. And it's like if algorithm A is better than algorithm B, algorithm guy A is going to knock out, going to make algorithm B guy go broke. So, you know, we're also heading to a situation where I think eventually some of these guys might go away and lose some of their revenue. It is, it, it is a very difficult situation. And, um, you know, again, I, we're all shrugging our shoulders here. I don't know what to do about it, but it is scary that when you uh, put, 
the do the math and see how much their play has increased, how much the the, the play from the non-computer guys has decreased. And it shows that there's been a pretty you know steady and 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 large exodus from the pools. And I don't think it's the two dollar betters. I think it's the guys that maybe bet you know a thousand dollars a race or five hundred dollars a race that are just you know getting their clocks cleaned by these guys. So you know we'll stay on top of this. Dan did a good job with that story, and uh, it's always something that uh, you know is, is is of interest and and a difficult subject for um, not only just California racing but racing as a whole. So what does Zoe Cabin have in store for us this week on First Things First? Is he the right horse for the Derby? You've been there before, and it looks like ground is not an issue to him. Distance is not an issue. No, I, I, I was telling somebody the other day that he's a lot like Giacomo, and that he's mentally he's very strong. Uh, nothing really upsets him. We well, ran. He ran a mile and a quarter in the Santa Anita Derby, did he not? <laughs> he did, right? And the other thing I was going to say, he's had a lot of adversity when he when he first raced it. He got dirt in his face. Oh. He was done. He hated that. But now, subsequently, other races, he's taken it and he's run through it and he's he's done really well. How excited are you to have a sister here? Oh, that's really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, we're really excited about her. She's a beautiful, beautiful union rag, uh, two-year-old filly out of Winding Way. And we just wait, hope for the weather to clear up a little bit and she can get out and we can see a little bit more of her. That's another thing about him. He's coming out of his races really well. He's kept his weight on and he's got a great hind on, end on him. He's got a huge heart girth, right? Big chest. Yeah. Lots of lung. Santa Anita Park's inaugural Hollywood meet will run through closing day on June the 18th. The meet does start this coming Friday and it's named as an homage to the track in Inglewood, which is now the site of SoFi Stadium. The Hollywood meet contains stakes races which began their history at the late, great Hollywood Park. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. Now for our Angel of Empire update, Flavian Pratt is chosen to ride Angel of Empire in the Kentucky Derby rather than Kings Barnes, who he had previously ridden to victory in the Louisiana Derby. Angel of Empire, of course, impressive in the Arkansas Derby April 1st, went to Churchill Downs on April 4th. His most recent workout last Saturday, April 15th, a half mile in 48 and one fifth seconds at Churchill. Of course, Brad Cox said he was pleased with that workout. Now, why are we talking about Angel of Empire? He's a Pennsylvania bred. Bred by Forgotten Land Investment Inc. and Black Diamond Equine Corporation. For more about breeding in Pennsylvania, visit www.pabred.com. Here in Pennsylvania, we're proud of our breeding program, the best in North America, but we're also proud to be leaders in this industry. The PA Horse Breeders Association is funding cutting edge research at Penn Vet to detect gene doping in thoroughbreds. And we endorsed the SAFE Act to help protect the most vulnerable horses. Plus, we're pleased to support the aftercare programs set up by our horsemen's groups. Just a few of the reasons why you should join us in Pennsylvania, the premier place to breed and race. Our Fastest Horse of the Week segment is brought to you by the Fast Stallions at Windstar Farm, including the stallion with breathtaking speed currently in his first year at stud. First, the honor of Fastest Horse of the Week goes to Skelly, the four-year-old practical Joe Gelding who won Oakland's Cal Fleet Sprint Handicap with a buyer speed figure of 105. In his stakes debut, Skelly defeated promising Godolphin sprinter Strobe and 9-5 to favorite Tahano Twist. It was also the first graded stakes winner for owners Chris and Emily Hicks of Tiny Mason, Texas. In fact, Skelly is their only currently active racehorse. Chris is in the oil and gas business in West Texas. They have been racing horses for less than a decade under the name Red Lane Thoroughbred. Skelly is trained by Steve Asmussen, was ridden by Ricardo Santana, and is bred in Kentucky by Alan Poindexter. Meanwhile, Windstar is the home of the ultra-fast and versatile Life is Good, who dazzled us with his speed in 2022. He was never beaten to the early lead in his 12 lifetime starts, but more importantly, he carried that speed. His four grade one victories were all 
around two turns, one in the Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, and the other three at a mile and an eighth in the Whitney, the Woodward, and the Pegasus World Cup. And he checks the pedigree box as well as a son of Into Mischief. Life is Good's 112 buyer's speed figure in the Jan Nehru at Belmont still ranks as the highest by any son or daughter of Into Mischief, topping authentic golden scents and gamine. Bob Baffert raved about him, Todd Pletcher raved about him, and you can breed to the fast stallion Life is Good at Windstar Farm. The Green Group's specialty is the thoroughbred industry, and over the years, they've helped over 500 clients in the horse business save money on their taxes. To learn more about how the Green Group might be able to help you in that area, go to www.greenco.com. And welcome in now this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Toshi Onikubu, who is the person behind the Net Kiba dot com website one of the very best racing journalists in japan and there's so much to talk about now of course with what's going on with the japanese horses toshi good morning in america good evening good night in japan uh thank you for staying up late to do this with us 13 hours time difference so we appreciate that um my first question the japanese horses coming into the kentucky derby there's so much excitement here in the u.s you have two that are definitely in the race. You might get a third. Is this a big story in Japan? Are people following it? Will the Japanese media be descending on the Kentucky Derby like they do when Shohei Otani pitched yesterday at Fenway Park? Yeah, first, thank you for having me, Bill and Randy. It's a pleasure to be on uh, this program. And yes, you know, it, it is a big thing. You know, we never send, you know, multiple horses in the Kentucky Derby, which is the uh, best racing in the world, you know, arguably. But, you know, they, on the dart racing and American racing, yes, definitely the best two minutes in the world. So it's, it's huge in Japan, you know, sending to run for the losses. We knew that world, we sharing that world, you know, it's definitely a big thing for Japanese racing fans. Well, Toshi, the whole world has seen the rise in Japanese racing internationally, but it seems like just in the last few years, uh, it's really taken off. And Japanese horses have won two races at the Breeders' Cup. They've dominated in Saudi. They've dominated in Dubai. What do you think are the reasons behind this sudden and dramatic rise in international success? You know, th th there's several reasons, Randy. You know, but one word would explain that, you know, those, those success would be investment. Japanese racing industry invests a lot for, you know, breeding side, you know, mares and stallions. And also, you know, the human resources, you know, education, you know, they send, you know, Japanese people to international to run and how to manage horses. And, you know, trainers also, you know, sending horses to the international stages. And they, they run and improved. You know, at early stage, it's not, it wasn't, you know, really easy to get success. And, you know, a lot of failure, you know, on that, you know, we get a couple of success. And as you know, and everyone will be aware of, you know, success in the international stages recently by Japanese horses. But it's based on a lot of, you know, challenge previously made by, you know, Japanese connections, I believe. Uh, Koshi, um, let's go down through the three horses that we're talking about. And I want to start with Mandarin Hero because, you know, we've seen him on U.S. soil this year, the only one of the three Japanese horses we have. Um, we were told that he's a good horse, but he didn't come from the JRA tracks. He came from the NAR tracks, which are, quote unquote, second string. Uh, did he surprise people that he ran so well in the Santa Anita Derby? Yes, definitely was a surprising result, I believe. And, you know, as you said, and for someone don't have much, you know, knowledge for Japanese racing. So there's JRA, that's, you know, Division 1, uh, League A, and NAL is League 2, Division 2, which is subordinated to the JRA and the primary, uh, the reading trainers. Uh, basically based in JRA, it's, you know, JRA circuit and Mandari Hero is not from JRA, so coming from NAL truck and, you know, running in the, 
the one of the best prep races for the Kentucky Derby, you know, international grade one race on dart and finishing very close second. That was really surprising result, but it's encouraging result as well. So on the other hand, Mandarin Hero might have been a bit of a surprise, but the Derma Sotogake has been running well in Japan from slightly off the pace. And then in Saudi, he ran well, but he seemed to take his game to the next level in the UAE Derby. Uh, I'm excited about it, especially the way Mandarin Hero ran at Santa Anita. Give us your sort of inside look, your scouting report on Derma Sotogake. How good do you think he is? I mean, Derma Sotokake is, you know, restart winner in Japan, but uh, it was, you know, Zenipon Nisayushin, which is one of the Japan Road to Kentucky Derby race. But it's locally grade one. It's JPN1 we call. It's locally grade one, but international restart race. So he won that. And he went to Saudi, disappointingly, you know, praised. But, uh, you know, then... In the, in the Dubai, uh, that was so impressive by him, you know, that performance and Christoph Romero ridden. And he's, he will ride, uh, Derma Sotokake in the Derby as well. So I believe he's definitely one of the best three years old, uh, horse on dart in Japan. But we don't really know. We don't get any benchmark compared to, you know, American horses. And it's a big task. And, as you mentioned, you know, we got recently, we got really successful result, not only tough and on dart as well, you know, Breeders Cup two years ago, uh, Marshall Rail and, you know, Saudi Cup, Pantharasa and Dubai World Cup, you know, Ushiba Tesoro. But, you know, we haven't really had those success previously. So it's still a big ask for the Masotokake. And, you know, I hope I'm wrong, but it's really, tough for him to, you know, a lot, a lot of things to overcome, I believe. Uh, Toshi, getting back to Mandarin Hero and how it relates to Derma Sotogaki, uh, I assume that in Japan, Derma Sotogaki is regarded as the better horse of the two, especially since he's coming from the better circuit. Were people saying that, my goodness, if Mandarin Hero can come within a nose of winning the San Anita Derby, then wow, what does that mean for Derma Sotogaki? He must really be in a good place. Yes, I think, I think, you know, Derma Sotokage is definitely the most exciting horse to send, uh, in Kentucky Derby from Japan. And Mandari Hero ran well in the grade one, uh, you know, primary, the prep race for the, you know, the Kentucky Derby. But at the same time, you know, again, you know, I say that, you know, it's, it's really difficult to see that. And, we're really, you know, looking for that as well. But at the same time, you know, Mandarin Heroes Santani Derby was questionable field, I believe, you know, compared to other, you know, yeah, they simply say, saying, you know, compared to the Breezers Cup Juvenile, you know, it, it's, it wasn't like that. So I'm not, the, I'm not sure how to trans, how transfer the form to US circuit from Japanese racing. But yeah, it's really exciting. But at the same time, you know, again, it's a big challenge for him. You mentioned the big. Uh, you've mentioned twice now that the uh, the obstacles, the challenges that Derma sotogaki has got to face. Uh, historically, the UAE Derby horses have not done well in the Kentucky Derby. Uh, arguably, none of them have been as talented uh, as Derma sotogaki Maybe Mendelssohn when he won so impressively a few years ago. But one of the challenges that American handicappers that don't really like Derma Sotogake, that believe that there are too many challenges, focus primarily, I think, on the travel aspect. Um, we've sort of come to believe that it's the trip from Dubai to America right before the Kentucky Derby has proven to be a little difficult to overcome. And in this case, Derma Sotogake has gone from Japan to the Middle East, and now from the Middle East to America. Is is the travel a concern for the Japanese? Yeah, that, that's the, definitely one of the concerns, I'd say. You know, travel and, you know, running in different country and quarantine, you know, training on different track, you know, they don't 
uh, train on the truck only. You know, they train, you know, mainly on the, the pre-training center in the JRA system because trainer have a uh, limit for, limit for the numbers of the horses in the stable at one time. So that's a lot of thing to overcome for sure. Toshi, we haven't mentioned the other horse, Continuar, uh, who's really flying in under the radar. Now, uh, he's not getting the attention that Derma Sotogaki is getting because he finished behind him uh, in the UAE Derby. Tell us more about him and could he surprise people? I mean, it's absolutely possible. And, you know, he's trained by the master Yahagi, you know, trainer, you know, internationally successful trainer in Human Breeders Cup, uh, two of it uh, in 2021. Uh, with Ravs on the U and Marshall Rail, and he won Saudi Cup and he won in Cox Parade, etc. So he's a really successful trainer at international stages, and he, you know, seems you know he he knows something that the other trainer doesn't know. So it's really interesting to see. And uh, Control is, uh, you know, seems uh, he doesn't have much ton of hurt, but uh, he stays really well. So it's. It's really, you know, uh, interesting to see, you know, a uh, little bit more trip for him in the Kentucky Derby, I think. So back to Derma Sotogake and surfaces. Uh, we are told that the racing surfaces on dirt in Japan tend to be deep and sandy. Uh, the racing surface in Saudi Arabia was on the deep side, fluffy, deep. But in Dubai, the Maidan racing surface is much more like an American racing surface in that it's, it's firmer and a little bit harder. Is, is that a point in Derma Sotogake's favor coming into Churchill Downs, do you think? Yeah, I think it, it, it can be. It can be, Randy, you know, and, you know, he showed, you know, plenty of speed and stayed well. And, you know, it was very easy, you know, one easy win. And, I'm not sure because, you know, he won the Zen Nipponisation, the race that last December in Kawasaki race course. You know, he wasn't reading the race, but in the UAE Derby, there was a different style for him and it was so easy. And I think as long as the pace is right and Christopher, Christopher Romero is a really good jockey and he knows what he's doing and, you know, what's best for Derma Sotokake. So as long as all the situation, you know, went everything good for him. I think it's definitely a good chance for him. Toshi, you brought up Christophe Lemaire. And tell us a story about how a French person started riding in Japan. And is he generally considered the top rider in Japan right now? Yes, he, he is definitely, you know, one, one of the best and, you know, arguably the best. And particularly, you know, uh, he had great ride, grade one races. You know, when it comes to the top class races, classic races, or the pinnacle of the racing, he always do well. And uh, I, I believe, you know, the, the story behind this, you know, he was riding in France and, you know, uh, the contract with Aga Khan, you know, it was finishing. And then, you know, he was short time get, getting, you know, short time license every year in Japan and, uh, finally, you know, JRA was accepting, you know, uh, foreign jockeys to get full time license and he applied and he got license. And since then, you know, he got the horse, like, you know, of course, uh, in Dubai, uh, that the son of Kitesan Brak, Equinox won really well and, you know, Armonda and Derby winner, et cetera. So he's definitely one of the best, I would call Japanese jockey. So, Toshi, I went back and looked at a lot of the Japanese horses that have run well internationally over the last few years. It started with Crown Pride and then Marsh Lorraine and Loves Only You and then Equinox and Derma Sotogake and some of the other horses that ran well in Saudi Arabia and some of the horses that ran well in Dubai. I came up with a list of 16 Japanese horses to go back and look at. Fifteen of them had Sunday silence in their pedigrees either as a grandsire or a great grandsire. How important has Sunday Silence been, in your opinion, uh, historically to the resurgence of, uh, of Japanese racing here or the upswing of Japanese racing in the last couple of decades? It's, it's a very good question, Randy. Uh, you know, as I said earlier, 
the Japanese invested a lot for breeding site, stallion, and mares, and also people. But I, I think the pivotal point for the Japanese breeding, bloodstock, and surrogate industry was, yeah, we, we got, when we got Sunday Sirens. Sunday Sirens changed everything. Of course, deep impact Sound of Sound of Sirens, the best Sound of Sound of Sirens, and the reading sire in Japan, the champion sire in Japan, was probably the first Japanese sire uh, internationally recognized uh, as a reading sire. But the point changed dramatically in the Japanese Harvard racing and breeding was when we got Sunday Sirens. So he got huge impact in Japanese racing. Toshi, I want to uh, segue over from the Triple Crown Kentucky Derby horses to Equinox, who Randy just uh, brought up. And uh, he was so impressive in the Dubai Shima Classic. We're reading now that I would think that after a horse won a race like that and with his credentials, the goal would be the Arc de Triomphe. We understand they're looking more so to the Breeders' Cup turf, which is great news for American racing. But but, but why is that? Why, why would they be looking at the American race over running in the Arc and trying to win the Arc? Yeah, you know, I, I'm not his owner, so I can't really say for that. But in my opinion, you know, it's really difficult and it's different test in the Arctic Triumph compared to the Japanese racing. And one thing is pace is very different. Japanese tend to go really fast at the early pace. But, you know, European, re you know, don't really get that fast. And of course, People say ground, but I think, you know, ground is, to be honest, it's the same for all runners in the race. But the pace, the pace they get used to in the racing and how to, you know, how to make the best effort in the race is really different. And that doesn't really suit Japanese horse in the Arc de Triumph. And, you know, the reason why I can see the, the, you know, the connection of Equinox considering America is one, one thing is this year is at the Santa Anita, the West Coast, which is closer to Japanese, uh, you know, which is close, close to Japanese, just close to Japan compared to, you know, uh, Kim, Kim Land or other race courses. So I think that's one reason. Of course, uh, the successful result we get. We got uh, two years ago by Yahagi's, uh, you know, Marshall Rail and Love's on you. That's really, you know, uh, supporting that you know, decision making process, I believe. Well, we're all excited about the international aspect uh, to this year's Kentucky Derby. Ed, how much do you think you'll see betting in Japan on these horses in the Kentucky Derby? Uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit tough. And for Jap at the first, I'd like to talk Japanese pool and time difference. Uh, Japanese pool will open at late, late night in night time in Japan. And, you know, Kentucky Derby is Sunday early morning. So it's a little bit difficult to, you know, engage as an, uh, you know, entertainment, uh, to Kentucky Derby for Japanese punters and Japanese racing fans. You know, the, person, you know, really engaging to racing as you, uh, in Japanese racing and international racing, usually they bet to the Kentucky Derby. But other than that, it's a little bit difficult for Japanese people. And in terms of the market, yeah, in Japan, probably Japanese horses will be, you know, will get shorter price compared to other market. Of course, you know, it's always the, there's tendency, you know, Japanese always support Japanese horses. And also probably there's lack of information about local horses, etc. And yeah, in the American market or you know anti post I can see in the international market for the Kentucky Derby, Terima Sotokake is I think one of the you know top five or six and twelve to one or something like that. Yeah, I'll be harsh to be honest, but it's yeah, it's a little bit short for me. It, it, again, it's a big ask. You know, winning a classic race is really hard for anyone. 
and winning a classic race in different country or different continent. As Randy mentioned, you know, it's including travel and travel from Dubai and previously Japan to Dubai. So it's, you know, a big task. And third for Tuang, for me, is a little bit short for the Rumors of Kake. And, you know, other horses, you know, continual get, you know, 50 to 1 or something like that. You know, it, it could be a good four place bet, to be honest. That's, that's why, what, what I would think. And yeah, even for the Rumors of Kake, yeah, I would say, you know, 25 to 1 or something like that would be something attentive for me. You know, that's respect for local horses as well. Well, some great insights from racing journalist, Japanese racing journalist, Toshi Nakubu. Toshi, thanks so much for joining us here on the TDN Writers Room podcast. And we look forward to the Japanese invasion coming to Churchill Downs on the first Saturday in May. Thank you so much, Bill and Randy. This should be interesting as this week's guest of the week, Toshi Anakubo, will receive a free one hour tax consultation from the Green Group. Any of you who know Lynn Green probably would not be surprised if Lynn also has a little bit of expertise in Japan tax law. For more information on the Green Group, go to DougGreenCo.com. Are you paying too much in taxes? The Green Group can help. There's a reason the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisors. They save you money and share successful strategies. Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport, like Eclipse Award-winning champions Jaywalk and Wonder Wheel. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. With some of the fullest fields in the country and quality racing year round, there's never been a better time to reap the rewards of breeding and racing in Kentucky. Purse money in Kentucky is at an all time high, as is average purse per race, outpacing California, Florida, and New York. Kentucky Breads. Breed them, raise them, race them. We all win. So T.D. Thornton's Derby Top 12 has hit the internet, and it's no surprise that the top nine and 11 of his top 12 are Kentucky breads. The outlier, the Pennsylvania bread. We've already talked about Angel of Empire, but his sire, Classic Empire, and its name, Armity's Angel, were both bred in Kentucky themselves. Meanwhile, tickets are still available for the KTA's Kentucky Derby Trainers Dinner, a longtime staple of Derby Week that benefits the Kentucky Thoroughbred Development Fund, a unique program that financially supports owners of Kentucky Sire Kentucky Fold Runners. The Derby Trainers Dinner will take place Tuesday night of Derby Week. That's May the 2nd at the Speed Art Museum in Louisville. For tickets, visit KentuckyBread.org. Well, no Triple Crown preps this weekend. They were all done with that with the running of the Lexington last weekend at Keeneland. By leaps and bounds, the biggest race of this weekend is the Oaklawn Handicap, $1 million out at Oaklawn, a grade two. Um, I got to imagine this is going to be upgraded back to a grade one pretty soon. You've got a field of seven in there. You've got Wayne Lucas trying to win three in a row with Last Samurai. Excuse me, Last Samurai. You have Stiletto Bay and Proxy or one, two in the San Anita Handicap. But guys, I'm going to give Charge It another chance. Um, I love this horse since he won the Dwyer by 23 lengths. He came back with a nice allowance win at Gulfstream. Then he got beat as the heavy favorite in the Gulfstream Park Mile. I don't know why. Um, I think he kind of threw in, um, at least from a buyer standpoint, he regressed that day. Interesting to see Todd Fletcher put blinkers on him. He's going from one turn back to two. Maybe that will help. I got to give him one more chance in here. Um, and how about Rated R Superstar? I don't think he's going to win this thing, but he's aged 10 years old and he's still out there fighting in these big races. So, uh, Hats off to the old boy. Let's see if maybe he can hit the board in that, this one. You know, this is just an absolutely sensational race. A lot of these, you know, spring, winter, big stakes for older horses have been impacted negatively 
uh, over the last four or five years by the Saudi Cup, by especially the Dubai World Cup. But this year, really, country grammar was the only horse of note from America in the Dubai World Cup. So as a result now, we get all of these top horses coming back in the Santa Anita handicap as well as the Oakland handicap. I mean, when you have Last Samurai, who's two for two at Oakland at this meet, you have the one-two finishers in the big cap, and then you have Charge It to Boot. I mean, that is a heck of a race along with some of the other horses in there. Charge It, I, I didn't see an excuse for him last time. I just thought he kind of underperformed. And you can read between the lines. I think Todd Pletcher sort of thinks the same thing because Charge It will get blinkers on for the Oakland handicap. So I think maybe Todd believes that there's just a little bit more in there that Charge It wasn't quite giving him in that last race. Proxy, a fast closing second to Stiletto Boy in the big cap, kind of back to his old tricks. Uh, didn't do much running at all until the field turned for home. And then he came flying down the stretch. Uh, you know, we'll see if that plays out at Oakland, which does have a slightly longer stretch run than Santa Anita does. So that might work in Proxy's benefit. And the coach is going to have the favorite, obviously, Zoe, in First Samurai. Oh, yeah, he definitely is. But I mean, what a terrific race. Now, my maths is not absolutely brilliant whatsoever. Seven horses in here, the owners of almost $10 million dollars. Five of these are already millionaires in here. So just think about that. This is a field for the ages. You mentioned the one, two finishes from the Santa Anita handicap, the big cap there. I, I like Proxy in here. I think he's going to run a blinder over that track. You just got to pedal hard. Rosario knows this horse. The closest this horse has ever been to the pace was with Z Rosario aboard him. So I think Proxy's going to come running, but it's a terrific race. Don't forget about Classic Causeway in here. The oh, trainer, yeah. Kenny McPeak, who likes to win races at big odds. This horse just missed by a length to Last Samurai, and we'll get Arietta a ride today for the first time. But Classic Causeway, 6-1 to one in the morning line. Just an absolutely terrific race inside and out. It really is. I can't wait to see it. And Randy, the morning line maker at Oakland, disagrees with you. Uh, he has made Charge It the 8-5 to five favorite in their last really? Samurai at 2-1. to one. So we have dueling <laughs> odds makers, Randy Moss and the uh, <laughs> Oakland line maker. So we'll see what happens with that. All right, Zoe, um, another big – we took last week off at Santa Anita, and they're coming back with a pair of staked races on Saturday's card, the Californian and the Kona Gold. What can you tell us about those races? Well, we're filming this before entries are actually taken. So, you know, I just have a list of the probables in, in here. I'm going to have to pull them up really quickly. Um, I mean, the Kona Gold looks like it's going to be a terrific race. Brickyard Ride is supposed to run there. I'm not sure if he's going to. Uh, Forbidden Kingdom is going to be in there, Positivity. As far as the Californian, uh, Defunded is uh, supposed to enter in there. He absolutely loves Santa Anita. Well, it'll be interesting to see if Hernandez will be back on him. He's had very good success with Edwin Maldonado, but I'm sure he'll go with the leading rider for Hall of Famer Bob Baffert. McLaren Rail looks like he's supposed to go in there. And then an interesting horse would be Tripoli, who got sent up north by trainer John Sadler to get a confidence booster. I mean, you guys remember Tripoli, right? Pacific Classic winner. He's still around. The TDN Writer's Room is brought to you by XBTV.com. And XBTV is the way to follow your favorite derby horses. Take a look at Forte in his first work back after a grueling effort in the Florida Derby. This is exactly what I wanted to see. A nice, easy half and 50. Now he's working with a very nice horse by the name of Bright Future, who's the son of Curlin. He won on debut. He took down an allowance race in his third start. Owned by the same ownership, and he's always a very, very good workhorse indeed. But Forte on the outside, under his regular rider, Hector, doing just enough in 50 and change. He got on a van after that very nice work and is now resting comfortably at Churchill Downs. We look forward to seeing more from Forte in the coming weeks.
all the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Writers' Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. The guys are right here wandering around somewhere at OBS right now. And if you'd like to join them, you can get into a partnership for just a fraction of the cost for trying to do it on your own. This week, meanwhile, in West Point Thoroughbreds, Dripping Gold delivered a fun, if agonizing, close win at Keeneland on Wednesday as he took advantage of a nice trip carved out by Tyler Gafflione and got his nose down right in time on the wire. A debut victor at Saratoga as a juvenile, the four-year-old son of Lemon Drop Kid was due for a winning head bob. He was beaten a nose and a neck in his final two races in 2022. That had to be a heartbreaker. Before returning with a fourth-place finish in a rough trip at Gulfstream last time out. Would you like to become a West Point partner and do some good at the same time? Send your bids on a 2% interest in the two-year-old Munnings filly, Lady Bonher, and pay no bills for the rest of her career. Email Sue Finley at the TDN.com for details or a bid. Learn more at westpointtb.com. This week's Remy Block cartoon appears every Friday in the TDN is in its derby time. If roses could think, what would they be thinking about now? Uh, Remy will give the answer in his cartoon. Well, that's a wrap on another edition of the TDN Writers Room. I want to thank Randy Moss and Zoe Cadman as they join us each week here on the TDN Writers Room and also our crew behind the scenes, Patty Wolf, who's our producer, Katie Petroniak, our associate producer, Anthony Laraka, Alita Laraka, and Nathan Wilkinson. They're our editors. Also, of course, Toshi Onakubu was our Green Group guest of the week. And last but certainly not least, a shout out to Lucy. Once again, taking her spot right behind Randy's right shoulder, our mascot, Lucy. She's as, as adorable as always. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening. See you next week.